Welcome to Find My Pass From Home. It is Wednesday, February 2nd, 2022. I can't believe it's February already, you guys. Like, this is crazy. What happened in January? January went super fast. Uh, okay, so um, I hope everybody is doing well out there. Put in the comments, as per usual, where you're at, what you're up to, what you're doing. We would love to hear from you. Uh, William's already with us. Thank you, William. Uh, he says it's super cloudy today. It, you guys, I'm in Colorado, if you don't know me yet. It is snowing like crazy in North America. Like, basically, the entire country is getting plummeted. Um, Roz is in snowy Massachusetts. They got a huge storm last year at, as well. Oh, Ellen, not snowing in Roscoe, Illinois. So he here at my house, we got about five, six inches overnight, and it's still snowing. My daughter is home from school today. That was scheduled early. It's just been kind of crazy weather-wise this week in the U.S. Uh, Elaine is in Massachusetts, got a foot of snow on Saturday. This last Saturday, it's just crazy. It's a huge storm. Okay. So um, Flo is with us from Oregon. William wants us to know, William, you can have it. Uh, you come over here, get your shovel and like take it with you. I mean, more <laughs> you, you can definitely have my snow. Um, that's good. Ellie is with us today in the comments. Everyone say hello to Ellie. Um, the, I am really hoping that this is going to be a good session, uh, and I'm excited about this one. I think this is going to be a lot of fun, actually. Um, so keep telling us um, what you're up to and where you're at in the comments, you guys, and talk to each other a lot. We would love to hear everything that you've discovered in the last few weeks. Uh, obviously, it's been a big month for genealogy in the UK with the release of the 1921 census. And of course, that is where we're going to spend our time today. Um, so I am, what I'm going to do, here's my plan. Let me know what you guys think of this. So I'm going to present just a small case study that walks through the idea of looking at the census, the 1921 census, and then pulling all the little bits and pieces of information out of that and showcasing kind of how we might use the 1921 census as kind of a, a platform or a home base for researching someone, making sure that we actually just get every little detail out of that record and really get all of it, all of its worth out of it. And then I'm going to put some other census returns up and I'm going to let you guys discuss how you might move forward on research with these individuals. So I found some really cool stories and hopefully this is something we can kind of all dig into. So basically the idea here is that we're going to crowdsource our way through ideas about researching these people. I want you to think about the methodology behind this experiment, though. Um, while this is a fun exercise, and I think you guys will all enjoy it, there is a process to this, right? You have heard me talk about this before. This is, um, Matthew just commented, 1921 brainstorming. Absolutely. it's That's exactly what I want you to do. But that methodology behind this is a known and trusted methodology in the world of family history. And you've heard me say it before, I'm going to say it again, fan research and social context. You guys, this is so important. And it really does help us explore the real stories of our ancestors, right? Many of us are so focused in thinking about the pedigree or the lineage. We really want to get into the details of their lives. So fan research, of course, stands for friends, associates, and neighbors, but we're going to take it much further than the people in the lives. We're going to look at their circumstances, their locations, their occupations. Everything that the census reveals to us is now something that we can use as a clue and an indication for our research. So there is absolutely a methodology behind this. Um, but at the same time, and you all know, right, if you've watched me before, I find this type of research to just be extremely satisfying. I enjoy it a great deal. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, okay, so let's just look at the comments really quick uh, before I share my screen. Okay, there goes my mouse. Lots of people chiming in. So it's good to see you guys, uh, especially all of you who've had, who are kind of repeat visitors. We love our community and, and we're excited about, um, about the growth and sharing that we all get to do here. Sarah is here from Wexford. Janet in Dorset, who's had sunshine. That's nice. Andrea is in Stoke-on-Trent. Lindy is in, oh, I'm sorry, Linda. <laughs> Not bad at all in Salisbury. Oh gosh, so many of you chiming in. It's so great to see all of your names and faces. It's so good. Um, 
Here's a good one. This one from Jackie, super excited. Had a message from a second cousin in Australia a couple of days ago asking if we're related. Lots of emails since. That's exciting, Jackie. Congratulations. We like to celebrate your successes. So please do comment what you've been up to. Um, all right, lots of comments. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, oh gosh, so many of you. Am I broadcasting in the dark today to add more mystique? Victoria asks, is anything wrong with my video, Ellie? Ellie's looking at it fine. So not sure, Victoria, what's going on. Maybe it's on your end, but double check your, your connection and everything. We'd love for you to be, um, be able to see us, all right? Uh, but if anybody else is uh, having video issues, let us know so that we can, we can adjust. Um, okay, so I'm glad I saw that one actually here. Fine here, fine here, Matthew and William says. That's so good. Um, okay, looks like we're all right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we're going to talk, we're really going to try and move beyond the 1921 census. That's kind of the name of my topic today. And we're really, like I said, we're going to really look through the census and try to examine as many details as possible. So like I said, I'm going to start with um, a, a small case study. So I'm going to present a little bit of a story for you guys. I'm just um, getting myself in a good place here. Sorry. All right. So let's start with the census return that we're going to look at for our small case study here. So hopefully you guys can see that. Okay. And actually, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take myself out of the screen so the slides are even a little bit bigger. of children there she's oh Ellie yeah thanks for fixing that Ellie it was running over the edges wasn't it um she's got Florence Lillian Scott she's got Mildred Palmer Scott she's got William Dudley Scott all children of hers right one at age 20 14 and 5 the two girls are born in the United States. They're born in New York, um, actually. And then her son, William, is born in Grantham. Then we have Benjamin Palmer, who is brother to the head of the household. So he is Ada Jane's brother, his wife, and their two children. Now, there's a number of really interesting components to this particular census return that I want to know more about for sure. Um, so as you guys look at this census return, feel free to, to plop in the comments um, exactly what um, you see on the census return, right? So start thinking about how you would approach this and how you would research this. So there's a couple of things here that I really want to know about. First of all, the 20-year-old daughter is a clerk. She's employed. Ada Jane is not. So Florence Lillian and the brother, Benjamin Palmer, are the only two adults who are employed in this household of eight people. Okay, that's worth noting. Um, Florence probably makes, let's just estimate, somewhere around half of what her uncle Benjamin makes. Um, so really, you have about one and a half salaries supporting a household of eight people. Um, there are... Um, eight people in this household, only six rooms. I definitely want to know how these two families end up living together, right? The, the children are born in New York. Um, their Ada is British. Her how, how does all of this come together, right? Ada herself is the head of household. She's the one who signs the document. How does Benjamin end up living with her? Like, What is the background? Where's the story here? So there's lots of questions we can ask. But the big question for me is that Ada lists herself as a resident of England, but she is American through the naturalization of her husband. She also lists that she's married, but of course, there's no husband on this census return, right? Where is the father? Where is the husband and who is that person? So let's start looking. Now, I... Um, Mud, I obviously have been working on this study, case study for a couple of weeks now since I found this uh, return in the, the week after the census was launched. Um, so bear with me as I work through some of the initial research findings that I have that I have uncovered. And some of you guys are already starting to comment. Beth is saying passenger list would be look would be interesting to look for. Absolutely, Beth. All right. So 
let's start with her passport application. So I found this actually relatively easy on just a basic search on Find My Past. So this is Ada Jane's passport application. It's dated 1920. So it's the year before the census, right? So there's a couple of really interesting things to note here. First of all, she says that she intends to return to the United States within two years. So if she's traveling in 1920 and she's in the 1921 census, theoretically, she should be back in the United States sometime in around 1922, right? Assuming that she, she stays the whole two years. We also see that she has indicated that her residence has been uninterrupted in the United States for 14 years, from 1900 to 1914. Okay, but wait a second. This is a passport application from 1920. She's been in the U.S. from 1900 to 1914. What happened between 1915 and 1920 when she fills out this piece of paper, right? There's a five-year gap there that she has not had uninterrupted residence in the United States. So that's a big question mark, right? That is definitely something that should clue us into what is happening with this woman. And think about what's happening in that time frame. She's in the middle of World War I and she doesn't have a permanent residence. That seems unusual, right? I mean, all the work I've done in the last few months around the interwar period indicates to me that travel um, for leisure during the war was really kind of frowned upon, right? <laughs> That's not, you know, that was not something that was typically done. So where is this woman? What is she doing? Why is she moving around so much? I have a lot of questions, right? And and of course, that's the fun of genealogy, right? Every time you find a new record, it opens more questions. So I'm going to keep going through my, my search process, right? Um, and I go and I end up at the 1910 U.S. Census. So this is the Scott household in the census. And I found this by looking for Ada and her children, right? Because Ada is relatively unique and Florence and Mildred are, are relatively unique names. I mean, it's not a Jane or an Elizabeth. So they are located in Brooklyn in Kings County, New York. Brooklyn is heavily populated at this time. Uh, and so the surname William is very common, but we do know, of course, now that we have her husband. Her husband's name is Scott. He, um, If you read the whole census return, you learn that he is actually born in England as well. And at this point, they still consider themselves um, citizens of England. They have not started the naturalization process. And, and the 1910 U.S. Census tells us that. So now we have a more complete picture of the family. We have Ada Jane, her two daughters, and now finally her husband. So then we keep going, right? So now I'm going to go and stick in New York records because I know where they are in 19, 1910. So 1905, they're in the New York State Census. You got to love state censuses. If you guys haven't played around with U.S. Census materials before, recognize that there is a national census taken on the the zero years, right? 1900, 1910, 1920. And then there is a number of state censuses. Not all states did that, but many of them did. And they are almost always, right, nicely sandwiched in between those decade censuses. So in New York's case, many of the state censuses were lost, but we do have pieces of the 1905 state census and a couple of others. So here is the family. Uh, this is the Scott family of Ada Jane, right? Her, her daughter Lillian is there. Of course, Mildred is not born yet. But in this census, we learn that William's first name, the husband, is actually Joseph William. It's another important clue that we haven't seen yet. Um, and again, they're listed as being born in England, and we have his occupation and their ages, right? So he's in the fireproof material business, whatever that really means. <laughs> I'm not, I haven't quite dug into that yet. So if anybody wants to, wants to stop and search fireproof material businesses in Brooklyn in 1905, that would be great. <laughs> Okay, then we move into passenger lists. And I know this has been suggested already a couple of times. So good for you guys, because you definitely were on the right track. Oh, Rosie, I love it. Fan acronym, fun adventure and notebooks. That's perfect. That's <laughs> so good. Uh, okay, so passenger list. This one is for 1906. 
And this indicates that Lillian, or excuse me, Ada Jane and her daughter Florence Lillian are arriving into the, into the harbor of New York, the port of New York. But look at the top of the manifest. This is a passenger list of alien passengers. And that's really important, again, building this story. Because from the 1921 census, we are told that Ada Jane is a naturalized citizen of the United States. And we're trying to narrow down that time frame and, and kind of the timeline of her adult life. But in 1906, she's listed as an alien to the United States, which means she is still identifying herself as a citizen of Britain. And if you look closely, and I, I didn't quite crop this, I should crop this out so you could see it better. But when you look at this record, you can note that she actually lists her place of residence um, as Grantham, England. And then over the top of that is scratched out and it says USA. She lists an address in Brooklyn as her actual destination. So we know actually where in Brooklyn they're living at this time. So in theory, we could kind of say, you know, this is probably um, Ada taking her new daughter, Florence, um, who's quite young at this point, over to England to see the grandparents and the rest of the family. That's kind of my guess, right? This is, this is her reconnecting and, and taking, um, um, taking the daughter to see grandma. Who wouldn't do that, right? I would totally do that. Okay. So then the next thing we find is actually over in England. So in the National School Admission Registers and Logbooks in, in our timeline, um, this is from 1909. So just a couple of years after, right? So the passenger list we just looked at was 1906. We're now in 1909. And here's Florence. She is listed as a student at the Spittlegate Church of England Primary School in Grantham. What? They're supposed to be living in England. Remember the passport application? It said that they were residents of the, or I'm sorry, they're supposed to be living in the United States. The passport application says that they are residents of the U.S. Un, in an unbroken pattern for many years between 1900 and 1914. But in 1909, her daughter is a student in England. Well, that doesn't make any sense. How can you be living in New York, but going to school in England right, in Grantham? Makes no sense. So, but she is absent. Um, we know that that day, but she comes and, and the next day she she is still absent. But later in the week, she's reported as still um, being, in a t being present, right? Um, so lots of questions, right? Our timeline is not quite working out here. Go back to passenger list. 1912, here they are again arriving into the U.S. And once again, they have left from the port of Liverpool. Uh, and it is once again, Ada Jane and her children, Florence and Mildred, no husband, both passenger lists, no passport application. The husband is completely missing from all of these records. Now, in this instance, she is arriving as a citizen of the United States. She is no longer on the alien passenger list. So by this point, she identifies herself as a citizen of the United States. So you have to assume at some point that either herself or her husband have gone through the naturalization process over here in the U.S. Right. There's a lot to think about here. Right. And um, and of course, it's not easy to see on slides like this. It's better if it's kind of all written out in a timeline format, but it is absolutely essential that we pick up all of these little clues from these very standard genealogical records. <laughs> Sally, oh my gosh, I love it. Okay, I'm gonna share this because this is great. This story is giving me a belly ache. What happens? We have to know, right? <laughs> I'm with you, Sally. And I'll admit, I'm not done with this story yet. But so here's where I'm at. I've got a list of questions. I've got this woman and her kids who are moving back and forth across the country. I'm not exactly sure where they live, what they're doing, what's happening. I go back to my original source. I need to learn more about Ada and her family in 1921. So I actually go into the maps and, and the extra materials of the census because I don't know a single thing about Grantham. I'll admit I never really even heard of it before I started on this particular project, right? So when I look at the maps on Find My Past, um, the maps associated with the census are incredibly good. Uh, they were scanned at a really high resolution. Look at this one. This is zoomed in to 640% and you still get this incredible detail. You can see it so clearly. Um, so for 
you know, for me, maps are fabulous. I'm looking through this map and the community for any other additional clues that I can pick up on. I want to know where they lived, but I also want to know what else is in that community. Is there some big industry that maybe was attractive to Ada Jane and her family? Is there some immediate connection with Brooklyn or New York or anywhere in the United States that would mean that these this family goes back and forth? Nothing really pops out to me on this map, but there's a lot to learn here. And again, I don't really know a lot about this area. So I'm going to keep this map handy so that I can refer back to it on a pretty consistent basis, right? Because I'm looking at the map for not just their physical location, but also the clues in which um, that might, might indicate to me additional opportunities for research. Okay, when we also look at the 1921 census, we want to definitely ex also look at all those extra materials, right? And that's made available to us on the platform. If you're looking at the census image itself or the transcription, you have an opportunity to search in a number of different ways. One of the things I started with was that I was curious about Florence, the older daughter, being employed, right, as one of the only two working adults in the household. And I noticed that she is working for the Rustin Hornley Limited Company. Um, and the transcription process tells me that there's only three people that worked for this business at, in the 1921 census, only three people who identified themselves as employed by this particular company. Um, I know that I can click on this button, see who they were, and it will pop up, or I can just run the search myself, right? If you go into the advanced search screen, you can just search by that company in that location. Um, so we've got it here, the Rustin Hornley Oil Company in Grantham. And here's my three people, right? So I've got Florence Lillian. Uh, she's the clerk. We've already looked at her. And then George Benjamin Johnson and William Johnson who also work there. So in theory, my, you know, at initial gl glance, because of their ages and their shared surname, I'm going to guess that these two are related. Now, I haven't had a chance to dig into the Johnsons yet. I will, because that's part of my friends, associates, and neighbors research, right? I want to know what kind of influence these two men might have had on Florence and her life and the rest of the household. I also want to make sure that I'm doing a really thorough search, and I'm still thinking in the back of my mind, I'm looking for the husband, right? I'm still, I still want to know what's going on with William. <clears throat> so I'm going to go to the official census reports of the 1921 census. Um, and again, I know very little about this area of England. So these are going to be really, really helpful for me. The official reports are available for every county on Find My Past, and they include the same pieces of information. So the list that you're looking at on the screen, population, buildings, education, occupations, dependency, and so forth. They took the, 19, the 1921 census just as they did with um, all the other censuses, and they use it to formulate information to run the government and run the country, right? And these reports were just that. This is their findings from a statistical standpoint of the census. So I'm looking for Grantham and information. One of the things that these reports can help me with is things like, how common was it for a married woman to be enumerated with or without her husband? And I learned that in the area where Ada Jane was living, there are just shy of 10,000 women who are not enumerated with their husbands. Okay, so A to Jane's situation isn't totally unique, but at the same time, it's not extremely common either compared to the 115,000 women who are enumerated with their husbands, right? So we, we're setting up a picture for ourselves, right? We're building this idea and this concept of what is Ada's situation in her family, in her very localized community, but also as just kind of an, a woman living in 1921 with three children in Grantham, England. Okay, so there are some some opportunity in these reports to analyze that and kind of build that big picture for ourselves. I would mention that these reports are actually free on Find My Past. You know, they're not part of a subscription. You just need a free account. So everybody can access these census reports and they are actually really, really useful. Another piece that's in this report that really directly applies to this particular case study is the documentation around nationality. So the reports analyzed the number of British citizens and aliens found county by county by county. So in this instance, in this area, 
we can see that there are six men and four women who identify themselves as citizens of the United States. You have to assume that, of course, Ada Jane and her two daughters are three of those four women. And then what I'm hoping is that William will act, the husband will actually be one of those six men and he will be found somewhere else in the county. Maybe he just wasn't home that night, right? Maybe he's doing something else. He's, I don't know, he's on a business trip or something, right? He could be anywhere. It could be at the pub. I don't know. So let's just see what this report tells us. We take this little piece of information. Now, if this report told me that there were a thousand people enumerated in that county as citizens of the United States, I would probably take a different tack, right? Because that's a lot of people to look at, but there's only 10. So I can run that search really easily. This informs me of a real opportunity in terms of researching the people of this particular area. So I take this information, I go, great, this is a really easy search to do. So I go back to the advanced search for the 1921 census and I search for just people who are identified with American nationality in this particular county, right? So I've got my location filter on. And actually the census comes up with 12 results. So the report and the census actually have a discrepancy, but I can easily see that we've got Ada, Florence and Mildred Scott there, just like we thought, right? Three of the four women in the report. And then no William Scott, no father, nowhere. He's so, so in theory, he has not been enumerated in this county in the 1921 census. So I took this a step further. I don't have a slide to show you, but I did search for a William Scott with American nationality across the census as a whole, and I came up with nothing, which kind of surprised me to be honest, because William Scott's a pretty common name and you would think that there was at least one guy in the country, but that's fine. No one, no one came up, no one popped up. So, um, a couple of things to note. You'll see it, as I search for nationality that I put America with an asterisk um, and that that location information has been standardized by Find My Pass. But at the same time, it's possible that they put American or, um, it, you know, other de uh, derivatives of how you would say United States of America. So I've put in an asterisk and, I, and I'm hoping for a wild card clue, which is probably why there's a discrepancy between the reports and the actual search results. Uh, okay, so that's census reports. Now, of course, we're going to move on because now we're in England. We're back in 1921. We know she's there. Let's see if we what else we can find. Of course, we want to look at electoral rolls. Right. So autumn of 1922, spring of 1923, she is at nine. Ada Jane Scott is at nine Edward Street in Grantham. Autumn of 1923, she suddenly has someone else with her. She's got this David Bomber Overton person also living in the house. Right. So who's he? Well, a quick search of 1921 census tells me that he is um, a native of Grantham. He's born there. In 1921, he's in the household of his brother, and it's a block and a half away. So it's very, very close. So at this point, I'm just presuming, of course, from electoral rolls, they tell me that he is just a boarder, right? He's a renter. If I keep going in electoral rolls, he's there again in autumn of 1924. So he's, he's at the home at least for a year, renting from Ada. And then if we skip ahead, because this pattern continues, he eventually moves out. In 1929, we finally have Ada, Florence, and Mildred, and another renter, Bertha Louisa Warren. So she's taken in another, um, another uh, boarder. And of course, the, the daughters are now eligible to be in the electoral rolls, right? Still, through the entire decade of electoral rolls, no husband. Not a peep of him. No clue where he's at. 9 Edward Street in Grantham is a townhouse. Um, in 1980, it went up for sale. So I can use the newspapers to kind of give me an idea of what the inside of the home looks like. Again, we're really focused on that friends, associates, neighbors style of research. So I want to know the situation in which they were living. I want to know how big the house is. And Real estate listings, even from the modern period, can really help me build a picture and understand the dwelling itself, right? Again, I'm I'm not 
necessarily familiar with Grantham or with typical home styles in England, right? Born and raised in, in the United States. And it's a different type of real estate. So I need that mental image to be built for myself. So in 1980, it goes up for sale for 13,000 uh, pounds. And I hope whoever lives there now is very happy. So we do a bit of house history there too. We're going to keep going, of course, with Ada in the 1939 register. She's listed at the same address, Ada Scott. She's now a widow. She's now listing herself as a widow. So presumably William has died. She's got two boarders as well with her who are significantly younger um, and employed, right? So she's there in the 1939 register as a widow doing uh, unpaid domestic duties. Note that it also originally said housewife, and that's been crossed off to domestic duties. And so I wonder if at some point William Scott was residing in the house with her as the head of household, but the 1939 register doesn't give me those answers. She finally passes away and she is buried in Grantham Cemetery. So she passes in 1951. Her headstone refers to our dear mother, Ada Jane Scott. There is no indication of William, the husband. He is not located in the cemetery as far as I can tell. And she, so she ends up living her life from basically 1921 all the way through 1951, the last 30 years of her life, it doesn't look like she ever comes back to the United States. I can't find her on another passenger list. Um, I can't find her on the departure list leaving the UK. She just seems to settle in England. So there's still lots of questions around this story, right? There's still a lot I'm working on. We're missing some key components. We're of course missing William, right? And with a common name like William Scott, and if he's by himself in Brooklyn, he's gonna be really hard to find. Um, we need the 1920 US census, and I haven't been able to find them there yet either. We need naturalization documents, right? If William naturalized, there should be a huge stack of material there waiting for us to discover. But again, with such a common name, it's been very hard for me to identify him in those documents. I still want to know what happens to the children. I want to know what they grow up to do and what happens with them, and especially the son, right? We haven't really touched on William Jr. yet, but if mom was going back and forth all the time and dad was in New York, exactly how did William Jr. come about, right? Because <laughs> those two people have to be together to make that baby. So at some point, Ada, uh, you know, that we've got to narrow down the time frame on William Jr.'s birth and exactly when and where he was, because it, uh, according to the 1921 census, he's born in England. Um, but where is dad at that time, right? And then, of course, who are the grandparents? What is their story? And how do these two people end up meeting? If they're both from England, how is it that they get married in the United States? And that's a piece that I actually didn't show you, but they did actually get married in New York. They did not get married in England. So at some point, they both make their way over a single people into the United States, and then they get married. There's a lot of questions here, right? But this is the process that you want to be thinking about when you're talking about fan research uh, and that methodology of thinking about how many questions can I possibly put down on a piece of paper and list out for myself and try to come up with, with these answers, right? So let's think about, as I've been talking, I know you guys have been busy. Um, let, so let me scroll up a little bit because I know I've had some good comments here. Lots of um, people's responses on what FAN stands for. That's delightful. That's really good. Furiously annoying names. That's really fun. Um, good. All right. Okay. So Ruth suggests there is a website for old New York newspapers online for free. Absolutely, Ruth. It's a fantastic resource. Fulton Old Newspapers um, and, and a fabulous resource. So yes, that's a great idea. We could definitely look there to see if we can find them. Again, the problem we're going to run into is that William Scott is such a common name and Brooklyn is so populated by this time that, you know, that metropolitan research, there's a whole nother methodology behind that that needs to come into play here. Um, okay, uh, let's see what else. Let's see. Okay, Karen says, something I've thought of is that she'd have to have good finances in order to be going back and forth. Absolutely, Karen. Um, and 
if you guys all remember that movie, oh gosh, what was the name of that movie? Where they show me the money. I think of that line every time. Um, and Ellie's shaking her head. It's um, what's that guy's name? Um, oh gosh, now it's gonna bug me. He's a really famous actor, and Ellie knows I'm not good at this kind of thing. Um, and that movie's from the 90s, and he was like an agent for a football player or something. Anyway, screams into the phone, right? Like, show me the money. That's what I think of every time I think about finances um, in, in terms of our ancestors. We absolutely have to follow the money trail. Where there are is money, there is documentation, right? There, I have another ancestor in Ohio that I'm just following through the tax records just year after year after year after year. Um, and it's fascinating, actually, right? Because he had a lot of money. Um, okay. so. Um, Sally's, I love looking at maps. Absolutely, me too. Um, do, do, do. Oh, Nikki, this is interesting. Grantham was the home of Maggie Thatcher. I did not know that. Thank you, Nikki. Um, and this is steam engine country. Okay, so that's another good note to make, actually. So that's a good contextual piece that I didn't have before. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, Linda says, where do you find the info about married women versus total women? That is in the 1921 official reports. There is a report for every county. And Ellie did share a link. So hopefully you found that. Um, and they are, um, they are available on Find My Pass for every county. Okay, I'm still just reading through the comments here. Da, 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 da. Okay, uh, and lots of you guys are answering your own questions, which is good. Um, da, da, da. Oh, Jerry Maguire, thank you. Thanks everybody, Tom Cruise, that's his name. Okay, good, yeah, that that is the scene that should be playing through our brains every time. All right, so now we've talked about my case study. What I wanna do next, I'm gonna put it back up on the screen is have you guys work through your own little pretend case study. So now we're gonna be paying attention to the comments. I need to take that one down. Okay, so example number one, and this is you trying to use fan research and the methodology of thinking kind of outside the box here a little bit. What do you think of when you see a census return like this? Okay, so this is John Niner and his family. He there in London. He is a wholesale wine and spirit merchant. Um, his daughter is also employed. They have um, the wife is there with him, and then his mother lives in the house. All British born. What do you see on this census enumeration that would possibly make you kind of go a little bit, hmm? I'm waiting for the comments to come through right? There's no youth in this house. They have six rooms, four people, relatively comfortable lifestyle. Someone is going to catch it eventually. There's something really interesting specifically for genealogists on this piece of paper. Victoria says he's got decent handwriting. He's educated. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, he's definitely a businessman. He owns his own business. Good comments, good observations, Victoria. Um, the daughter works for the claims department. She's a clerk. Ah, uh, Karen finds it. Something at the bottom by the signature. Let's pop that up on the screen. Kindly note that my name is not Nyler, but it is Niner. Guys, how many of us have run into a problem when the index um, or the transcription is incorrect or maybe the handwriting is slight, sloppy and we can't quite tell what the surname really is in this instance he's told us and he is writing this message to the government he's saying stop getting my name wrong it's n-i-n-e-r this is an automatic red flag for anybody researching this family because this is a, an indication of frustration look at how many times he's underlined it right you can imply his frustration from the way he's written it so there is a real opportunity here for research because as you are working through historical records 
you need to know, right, and flag that his name is often going to be misinterpreted and incorrectly written with an L instead of an N. So yeah, and Matthew says good for him and good for us, right? This is an automatic clue to the fact that the government often misinterprets his name and he's frustrated by it. This is a gem for anybody who has been who who wants to research this family. So, uh, absolutely fantastic find, right? That his his surname is often misinterpreted. I I love this guy. I love John. I think he's wonderful. <laughs> um a, absolutely really really helpful, right? <clears throat> And it does happen all the time, right? Andrew says, right, this this have, happens all the time. Loads of surnames on envelopes, even when I spell it using phonetic alphabet. Absolutely, right? But this is, this is a really, really good clue for anybody working on this family. Okay, so that's a, that's a good start. That's a good start to my experiment on crowdsourcing fan methodology with you guys. Here's the next one. Let me see if I can get my thing to click. There we go. All right. Here we have um, a household return, very typical household return, right? Schedule E. Um, we have uh, Miss Lee at the top. We have Margaret, Edith, Amy. Um, we have, uh, let's see, they're all visitors except for one. One, the head of household is actually on the bottom line. Um, the head is 57 years. The um, other ladies on the return are all kind of youngish, right, in their teen years and, um, and in their 20s. And yes, Karen has already <laughs> noted that we need to look at the bottom of the screen. It's hard to read. Yes, it is, Karen. Um, these are, look at their occupations. They're teachers. They teach at a girl's school. Matthew clinches it. It's a guides camp, a girls guide camp. So which school hosted the camp? Absolutely right. Let's zoom in on that. Do, do, do. There we go. Okay. So girl guides camp in a barn, right? In the forest. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant return, right? And look at the box of the house, you know, the house and the room numbers, right? The enumerators actually crossed out that they have four females in four rooms. They are actually captured in the census while they are in the forest, you guys. This is <laughs> pretty incredible. I was a Girl Scout, right? The U.S. version of um of of girl guides right and and i can't even imagine right a census taker coming out to my girl scout camp and talking to my troop leader about <laughs> who they are and where they were born absolutely incredible right so this is full of opportunity for fan research first of all these women pretty much all live together or work together, right? They're all teachers at the same school, um, except for the, well, the top two are listed as house duties, but there's a music teacher and then there's the headmistress um, for this school. So you could absolutely research the school itself, right? You know that this situation of this girl's guide camp is temporary. And when we look at that all important front of the household return, we get the address and a little bit more pops up. They know that this is um, the census return of Miss Reynolds, girls high school. Um, and then it says, but in camp for one week, June 18th through 25th. So if the census had, not, had been taken in April when it was supposed to be, we wouldn't have this little piece of information. This only occurs because the census was delayed and it happened on the 19th of June. Right. So we know that they are at Soper's Barn in the Clark, Clark Forest in Andover at the time of the census. And this opens up a whole nother opportunity. Right now, I want to research girl guides. I want to know about the camp. Was it an established place or did they just like find a nice spot in the forest and like set up some tents? I want to know all about this particular entry and how these women became involved in the organization. Were they you know, girl guide leaders for a really long time. Was this something they were really passionate about, right? These organizations tend to have real loyalty in their volunteers. So, you know, my own mom, right, was a troop leader in Girl Scouts for, I don't know, probably 20 years or something, um, a really long time, right? So these, these people are typically very dedicated. Um, so I want to definitely know, um, 
uh, all about this particular situation. I love this. Karen says you can't escape the census, right? This is so good, so true. Um, Karen, another Karen, a different Karen, found my great uncle on a holiday in Devon at a boarding house in the 1921 census. That also opens up a huge amount of research opportunity, right? Um, oh, this is, and this is good. Claire attempted to plan a sleepover, sleepover or camp for our next census. Yeah, do it, Claire. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. So Linda's starting to move on here. It's shoot for us, according to Uncle Google. Thank you very much. I didn't actually have time to dig into this before I started today. So that's really good. Um, you know, don't be surprised to see me talk about these census returns again at some point because I'm totally hooked. Ellie and I were talking about this before I started, right? The, the idea of just like finding all these little nuggets. I can't wait to dig into them. And William, of course, wants to have a genealogy camp. Um, I love that. Um, so over here, there's actually a group of people in the... in. Um, where are they, Michigan maybe, or Wisconsin? And they basically started a genealogy camp. They have this property with a bunch of cabins and stuff, and they have people come for a week and they have these great discussions. I never got a chance to go uh, before COVID, but I do hope that they pick it up again, because uh, I would love that, right? Like a week in the summer out in the country where you can really think and disconnect and hang out with other genealogists. That sounds perfect. All right. So that's a great, a, another good example. So a lot of opportunity for research there. And you guys are applying your, your fan technique um, very thoroughly. So I love it. Find my past camping trip. Yes, Ellie, let's do it. So side note, I have realized that most of my British colleagues and Scottish colleagues do not know what s'mores are. For those of you who are in the US, uh, s'mores are apparently not a thing in the UK. Um, so I am planning the next time I go over, I will be taking marshmallows and graham crackers and American Hershey chocolate, which I know is far inferior to British chocolate, but you got to have the real experience. And I am making s'mores for my colleagues. That is a, a promise. And now I've said it live. Uh, I'm totally doing it. They deserve to have s'mores, real s'mores. <laughs> okay. Um, they do deserve it. All right. So here's our next example. Again, a nice, um, nice, you know, standard, standard household return, right? Schedule E in the census. This is Joseph um, Bethany as head of house, his wife, uh, two sons, two daughters. Uh, he's a laborer. They have a nurse child in the house. And anybody else pick up, where should we start our research here? What is it that pulls our attention about this particular family, right? Um, so there is a note, of course, there's always a note, right, down at the bottom. And it says that Ronald here is a nurse child, night and day, not adopted, underlined. The mother can claim any time. How do we, as genealogists, go about understanding and exploring in historical research and re historical records how this came to be and whatever happens with Ronald? Where is he in life? How does he end up in this household? He's only three years old at this point. His parents are both alive. What was the first thing that you would do? Where would you start? And we know, of course, that we need to understand what a nurse child is. Um, so, and, and I was going to explain it, but Michelle explained it for us. So thank you, Michelle. We'll put you, give you credit for that. A nurse child was a child that is given to a breastfeeding mother that is feeding the baby, right? So this is not someone who is a member of the household. And you can probably assume that he is not related to this family either. He could be, but it's likely that he's not. But that also tells us that the mom in this household probably recently had a child or was pregnant, right? Because it's the only way that this can biologically happen. So let's look at this. The youngest child of the Bethany's is, um, where are we at? Se um, seven is seven months old. And Joseph, the sibling, the next oldest is two years old. So if we have a three-year-old in the household, that fits right? Because she probably started nursing this child when she was pregnant with Joseph and has been nursing him, him since, in theory, right? It could be that this is a new situation. We don't really know. But this, 
Ronald is definitely in the house because the mom has recently been pregnant. Okay, this is a wet nurse, right? So what else? Where else can we go? How can we possibly find the rest of this story? And I'm waiting for some of you to start thinking about additional resources. William has a suggestion. Uh, definitely a good one. Check neighbor's surnames to see if you can find a match. Absolutely. That's a good start. See if you can find his birth and christening. Was the mother related to anyone here? Absolutely. Matthew, a really, really good first step. I'm looking, I'm just reading through the comments. Beth explains s'mores for us. Um, Beth, the only thing that you missed, I think, is that the, it really has to be a toasted marshmallow over an open fire. That's the important piece. It's got to be like a campfire situation of a s'more or else you don't get the smoky flavor. All right, Victoria's got another suggestion. The maiden name of the mother could be a relative. Absolutely. There's a lot of opportunities here, right? Ah, here we go. Now we're starting to think a bit broader. Matthew says hospital records could give us clues. Absolutely. There's also the possibility of researching Ronald as an individual, right? What happens to Ronald in the future? From the 1921 census, one of my first actions would probably be to go to the 1939 register and see if I can identify Ronald as a, an adult. There's lots of theories that we could kind of come up with and, and suppositions, right? So Michelle's presented one for us. Do, do, do. Either the natural mother couldn't feed their baby or others would sometimes take on another child as a form of contraception or babysitting, right? It's harder to get pregnant if you're breastfeeding all the time. Maybe um, this was a um, compensation thing, right? Maybe the family needed more money. But at the same time, we have this statement where the mother can come claim them anytime. It's almost as if they're begging the government to kind of coordinate something around, can you please come get this child, right? <laughs> um, and and the, the emphasis on not adopted, we have to read through that and interpret that as well and at least build some theories and some hypotheses around what that possibly can lead to. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next one because this is one that I, I really, really want to leave you guys with. Um, and, and I hope that some of you will take some of these and go, ooh, I want to play some more this afternoon or this today, whatever time zone you're in, and really start to dig in and think about expanding your research and how you can apply this type of technique to your own family history. Okay, so here's, this is maybe, I don't know, uh, this is definitely my top five favorite returns so far for the 1921 census. This is a census. Look at this beauty. This is so good. So, so good. All right. This is Miss Hollingsworth. And we actually only know her name immediately because it's on the address form on the front of the, the front of the return. Can you, I know you guys can't read this and I'm waiting for someone to start commenting. There we go. Now you're seeing it. That's good. Um, there is a little bit of a delay in my conversation versus the, the live feed. So I'm waiting for you guys to catch up with me here. Look at this. This is a genealogist. Absolute dream. Absolute dream. So what in the world does this say? Let's zoom in on this. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, uh, we did actually transcribe the whole thing. A number of colleagues jumped on this right before the call because I found this about 15, 20 minutes before I started the session. And so my thanks to Miko and Ellie and Aoife. Um, and I don't think I'm missing anybody. I think those are the three that jumped in to help me transcribe this really quickly. So thank you all very much. This is an absolute dream. So here's what it basically tells us. This is um, Amelia, I think is her first name. Um, and she writes that um, she cannot fill out the census because she lost her papers at the age of 15. They were entrusted to the late Mrs. Forbes, wife of a minister um, of a Church of England parish in Paris. I am not going to try and pronounce the location because I cannot. Um, I know that. I'm going to, I'll butcher it to death. 
It tells us that she was born in India in 1857 or 58. She's not sure. There's no name of the town. She can't remember where in India. She says that her father was in the civil service and her grandfather was an officer in the British Army. Both these men died early in life. The mother's maiden name um, is, is listed in the document. Her mother was French. She was born in Egypt. <laughs> it just keeps getting better. She does list the father's full name, John Thomas Hollingsworth. And she mentions that she is single and alone at the time of the census. Holy cow, you guys. This is like, I mean, the ultimate find, right? I mean, wow, what a story. There are so many opportunities for research on this. This woman's story just absolutely has to be told. And we're going to tell it. We are absolutely going to tell of it. Tell it. So where do we start? We're going to look at um, uh, birth records. Absolutely. Right. We're going to look at, oh, Victoria. Oh, this is a good idea. We're going to talk about traveling and passports. We're going to look at military records. Um, Victoria says, um, look at the British embassy in Paris. Yes, absolutely. Right. And this is, this is just an looking in India records, right? Karen's on it already. Go Karen, go. We have the British and India collection that we can utilize, right? This is just um, a wealth of information. Sally's saying that's extraordinary. I completely agree. Newspapers. I can't believe it. No one said newspapers yet. <laughs> Right. Um, William, French, but born in Cairo, Egypt. So were their relatives there when the British moved in? Could explain why they came to England via India. We need to know more about the French Egypt history in that relationship. Right. Why is why is she um, why is and, and the mom is born in Cairo and is French? How does this all work? Give them time to digest. <laughs> No, I'm excited and I want to like not do any of my work for the rest of the day and just work on her, right? Matthew suggesting Commonwealth records, overseas birth, marriage, death. Absolutely, Matthew, good call. We do need a double session. I agree, Sally, and I will make you a commitment right now. I will be back at some point to tell this story. We'll figure this out. We can crowdsource this if you want, but we will definitely present this story and figure out what happens here, right? Victoria says Italian church records can be gems if you can read them, provide family info. If the parents are married in France, there's got to be, you know, there has to be parish records for this, right? French um, Catholic records and and a um, Church of England parish in France, right? That is a story in and of itself, especially the history um, of the relationship between the two countries at this point in time, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, you know what? Um, Matthew says you should leave this with all the, oh no, Matthew, you do not get to have all the fun on this. I get to play too. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, isn't this, I mean, when you think about a census, right, you tend to think about just kind of this really generic form. And that's not at all what the census is, right? The census, and no matter what country you're looking at, no matter what um, what year you're looking at, the census is full of just incredible information. It's absolutely one of my favorite record sets, bar, bar none, right? And that is true for the UK. It's true for the United States, Canada, us, even Australia, in which they destroy their household returns. The statistical information from those government reports is absolutely exciting in terms of research opportunity. Um, it's just really phenomenal, right? So I've shown you some examples that are very clearly exciting, right? I mean, it doesn't get much better than this, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of household returns that are very generic that list this kind of well, maybe not to this detail, but a lot of really good detail that we tend to kind of take for granted. And it's really important 
that we analyze every little bit of detail on every single census return that we're looking at to broaden the story of our ancestors, right? We're not just looking for when they were born and, and you know, maybe what address they were in. We want to know the stories. And those standard household returns are full of that information. We just have to dig for it, right? We have to find it. Um, so, oh, Joan asked, um, in the bottom right-hand corner, it says, see back. Do we know what's on the back? Um, yes, on the back is of this return. And I actually did put it up, but I didn't really talk about it much. Let me go back to that. Um, so the, um, the full back of the image, oh, and I cropped it actually. So hang on, let me, I'm working on this, share my screen again. So the household return, um, uh, the form, right, for the household lists the basic address information, and I kind of included it um, in um, in a little snippet here. You can kind of see that screenshot. The rest of the form has, um, on the back, um, it has one or two comments from the enumerator, but nothing that really reflects um, the personality of this particular individual. So there's a couple of notes, but it wasn't anything that I was like, woo. Uh, it was kind of some standard stuff about why she doesn't have her, her information filled out and her return filled out pro appropriately. Um, yeah, so that's that's what, kind of what's on the back. Okay, so let's finish up with just a couple more comments. I know this kind of stuff is exciting. Um, and I have to say this, Elaine, you commented by my, by comparison, my family has been very boring on censuses. I would urge you to take a second look. I really, really genuinely say that. It's not just because this woman's census return is so in interesting and detailed. It's because the census is full of information that is hidden away from us in a government form. We just have to look for it. We have to get a little bit creative, think outside the box a little bit, and Maybe maybe the story isn't spelled out for us like it is with this particular woman, but the story is actually there, okay? So it does exist, and it is in the census. It's just that we have to work a little harder for it. Um, okay, and then Sally says, I'm not going to sleep tonight. Me either, Sally. I mean, I know I have hours ahead of me in my day, but yeah, this is going to keep me up for a while. Okay, we are officially out of time. Um, and I'm going to end with how exciting that was. That was a really fun session for me. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. I'm going to start to try and play a little bit around more with this kind of methodology research focused type um, session. So I hope you guys are enjoying this type of, of presentation. Um, Michelle wants to know if that is a picture of me baton twirling in the background. Nope. That is actually my daughter. Um, she is a competitive baton twirler, but thank you for noticing. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to convince her that she needs to do a contest in England so that I can come over more often. All right. Okay. So thank you so much for joining us um, today. Uh, we are always really happy to have you. Definitely. I saw somebody commenting about taking this particular census return to the forum. I think that's a fabulous idea. Um, so Ellie's... Um, Ellie's indicating that's going to happen. So that's fantastic. Um, you guys, this is a lot of fun. I really hope that um, that you enjoyed it as well. We will be back on Friday. I'm trying to remember who's on schedule on Friday. It's Ellie. Fabulous. Ellie will be with you on Friday for Find My Pass From Home again. And this week's records, um, a good set of records this week, actually, one that is particularly close to my heart. Um, so I'm kind of excited about this week's release. I'll just tease you with that. We will leave it with that. Have a wonderful day. Uh, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Do your research. Let us know what you find. And with that, we will see you guys all on Friday. Thanks so much. Have a great day.